Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to help support the show by becoming a premium member, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash podcast to sign up. Memberships are only $2.99 a month. By becoming a premium member, you'll be able to download episodes onto your mobile device and listen to them commercial-free wherever you go. Also, if you'd like to check out the new Dogman Encounters t-shirt store, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash store and take a look around. Buying a t-shirt or sweatshirt there is another great way to help support the show. As always, thanks for listening. Alright, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Mike. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, Vic. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. Mike, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm 45. I'm from Germantown, Ohio. Uh, pretty much grew up here. I work for a medium-sized company and administration. I'm not crazy. <laughs> um, I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody else. I grew up running around in the woods when I was younger. I had three-wheelers, dirt bikes, so I'd be out riding those all the time. I'd go out for miles away from the house, um, be gone all day. I'd go hunting when I was younger with my uncle and my cousin. Didn't really do it so much after I got older. But when I was younger, I would hunt with them, so I've never really been afraid of the woods at night. And I know most of the animal sounds, so I'm not somebody who gets spooked just because they're in the woods at night or anything like that. That's pretty much about it. Well, it sounds to me like you had a really fun childhood. I did. I got to grow up in the country for the most part, but I had dirt bikes and three-wheelers and stuff, so it was, yeah, pretty fun childhood. Kids nowadays probably wouldn't enjoy it because none of them really want to get out and run around in the woods and be outside, but that's pretty much how I occupied myself back then. (laughs) Yeah, that does sound like a really good time. What kind of interest did you have in werewolves when you were growing up? None really. It wasn't really on my radar at all. Other than when I was a little kid, like like a little kid, like maybe five, six, seven, and eight years old, at my grandma and grandpa's house, they would watch the old 50s and 60s scary movies. Those would come on late at night on the weekends when I would spend the night there. And I would watch like the old Lon Chaney Wolfman movies and like the Dracula movies with Bela Lugosi and everything. And those kind of movies would be on like Hell House with Vincent Price. So I would watch those movies, but I didn't really think about like, oh, that stuff could be real. I was just like, oh, yeah, it's movies. It's cool. I liked it. I liked the scary movies and everything. But I would say Dogman, Werewolf, things like that wasn't really on my radar at all until I seen the movie American Werewolf in London, which I think was probably one of the best werewolf movies ever. And then at that point, I started like thinking, oh, yeah, that's cool. Like Then I got into the werewolf movies and then vampire movies, too, just scary movies in general, but really did not have any thought that those things existed at all. Bigfoot, I was kind of skeptical about it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, because everybody talked about it growing up. And it seemed more, I guess, plausible or possible that a Bigfoot could exist, like a Gigantopithecus might not really be extinct, something like that. But as far as dogmen slash werewolves, not really on the radar at all, as far as something I really thought about, until the actual encounter. I was just kind of a fan of movies. Yeah, sounds like you're watching all the good stuff back then. You have the Lon Chaney ones. Of course, I like the newer movies better, but back then, when there wasn't all that much in the way of selection, those were some great movies. Yeah, special effects are a lot better now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. You live close to Germantown, Ohio. On previous shows, Adam Davis has talked about all the dogman encounters that have happened around there. Have you put any research into those encounters? I have, actually. I do live in Germantown, well, German Township, and I started listening to your show, and then I heard his encounter, and I was like, wow, and it was actually on the same road. I think he's had multiple encounters. I can't remember, but I do know that he had one encounter that was actually on Anthony Road, if I'm not mistaken, and that's where I had mine. So then I started trying to, like, Google more about, like, Germantown, werewolf sightings, the black dog. There's some people that talk about the black dog. I've heard some people tell those stories. So I started Googling things like that, trying to find more stuff. It's not really a whole lot out there. The stuff that I originally found out about was like Adam's story, a few others, but it doesn't really seem like a lot of stuff gets published. I don't know if that's agencies trying to scrub 
information so that people can't find it. I don't really know. But I would say that I'm a researcher in the aspect that I listen to your show every Friday. I'm trying to go through all of them, actually. And anything Dogman related I can find on the Internet, I read about. But it doesn't seem like there's much getting reported here in Germantown as far as, like, actual documented stories other than, like, Adam's and the stuff that Jody and Dave have kind of looked into. It's just your typical stories that you hear people talking, and that's really about it. You hitting a brick wall when you're trying to research encounters in that area doesn't surprise me because if you think people are cryptic about their Sasquatch encounters, wow, that's nothing compared to people with their dogmen encounters. I can see where a lot of people wouldn't want to talk about it. Like, you know, how like the Native Americans, like they believe that, you know, they don't talk about like skinwalkers, when to go, things like that, or Bigfoot because it might bring them around. I think maybe that's why some people don't like to talk about that stuff. And then also I think ridicule is a huge part of it. Society just loves to like point fingers and laugh at people. And I think a lot of people don't want to tell about their stories because of that. And I think that probably the police department doesn't want the headache of people coming around and going hunting for dog men in the woods with guns and, you know, like something bad happening there. So I'm sure they probably try and keep the cap on it too. I mean, I hate to say it, but I think if I was in law enforcement, that would probably be my opinion on it as well. You know, don't let everybody know this thing's out here because we don't want everybody out here hiking around looking for it. Oh, I'm sure the government most definitely does want to keep wraps on it. In fact, if you think they want to keep the Bigfoot phenomenon quiet, imagine how much they want to keep this old dogman phenomenon quiet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, big time. Speaking of other encounters in your area, what can you tell us about the Butter Street Monster? I remember growing up as a kid, you always heard about the Butter Street Monster here in Germantown. Every once in a while, I'll talk to somebody that says, oh, no, I've never heard of that. And I'm like, really? I'm like, you're from Germantown and you've never heard of the Butter Street Monster? I don't know how far it goes back. I can say that the oldest story that I know of was my uncle. He was coming home from work one night and he was, uh, I think, I can't remember if he worked second shift or third shift. I think it was like second shift, but it was late. It was that night. He was coming home and he turned on the Butter Street and he said he was going down the road and he seen something huge standing in the middle of the road. And as he got closer to it, it kept getting bigger and bigger until finally he was like, no, okay, no, that's not a person. I don't know what that is. That's freaking Bigfoot. So he put his car in reverse and backed up till he was able to get turned around. And I remember him saying that he kind of went a real long way going home. Like he kind of like looped around the whole town to go home because it just gave him like a creepy feeling. So that was like probably the story that I hear about that was the oldest incident. And then people growing up that were around my age, like all their parents and grandparents, you'd hear them be like, oh, yeah, the Butter Street Monster will hit you. And then I heard one story, and I don't know if it was true, but kind of one of those I heard from a guy who heard from a guy that supposedly some people were out there and it ran up behind their car and lifted the back end of the car up off the ground. So they couldn't get away from it. Like the tires were just spinning and it held the car for a couple of seconds before it dropped the car so that they could take off. But I don't know who I wasn't actually personally friends with the people that that supposedly happened to. You would just hear everybody talk about it. The only person that I know that says they had an encounter close to me is my uncle. Speaking of your uncle, how did he describe the creature that he saw that night? He's not really a detail kind of guy. He said he turned on the road and he seen it standing in the road. And then the closer he got, the bigger he realized it was until it just kind of scared him how big it was. Because he was like, you know, that can't be a person. And then he just said he put his car in reverse and then got out of there and went home. Well, I can't say I blame him. Yeah, well, I don't blame him either. But that's really about as detailed as he would get about the story. He would just say, oh, it was huge. He's like, it was Bigfoot, Butter Street Monster. And he's like, I turned around and I went the other way. I don't blame him. Don't blame him at all. Before you tell us about your encounter, Mike, please tell us about the place where it happened. Anthony Road in Germantown. Same place that Adam had his sighting. If anybody wants to kind of get an idea of what that area looks like, I think a Google Earth search will show you the aerial views of that area. Anthony Road is a very narrow road. You can't turn around on that road. Two cars can barely pass each other. You kind of both have to pull off of the road to be able to pass each other. It's not paved. It's gravel. On one side of that road, you have a little bit of a tree line, and then it drops off into a creek. On the other side of the road, it's usually cornfield, or every other year I think they alternate with soybeans. So pretty thick, densely 
wooded area. There's no houses on that road. There used to be one house. Thinking back, I always felt like there was two houses back there when I was younger and we would go out that way. But now when I went out there, and I hadn't been out there in forever, but then after listening to your show and stuff and then kind of hearing about Adam's Encounter, I went back out there to check it out during the daytime, of course. And I only noticed that there was one house. So I can't remember if I'm mistaken that there was two houses on that road or if it was just always the one house. Really all it is, it's a connector road that connects from one road over to another road that's a few miles away. And that's really all it is. There's nothing else out there. The one house that is there on that road, it was purchased by the Jackson Township Police Department, and they apparently use it for their training grounds. Now, I guess that's where their shooting range is. I'll tell you something odd about Anthony Road on both sides of the road, and I don't know how long ago they've done this. because It had been quite a few years since I'd been out there, because I had gotten older, moved away from Germantown for a while, and wasn't really out in this area. But then once I moved back and started listening to your show, kind of started thinking more about what happened to me out there. So I went out there, I think it was last summer, in the middle of the day, to check it out. And I remember, I think Adam talked about this in his interview, where they've got the gate up to where they can block the road off. And sometimes the gate will be open and you can drive up and down the road. And sometimes they close it off. And I think they close it off at night, but they leave it open at day. But on one end of the road, they've got a sign that says warning, like warning or notice or something like that, area under 24-hour video surveillance. <laughs> but when you're out there, there's nothing out there. I mean, there's no other property that they need to keep from being damaged. I mean, it's literally just woods. So I find that sign weird. Like, why are you videotaping this area when there's nothing out here? It's pretty desolate. I would definitely say to the listeners, do a Google Earth search for it and look at that area. You can see how densely wooded that area is, and you can really get a feel for how small that road really is. I mean, it's kind of weird how it's just out in the middle of nowhere like that. Well, from the way you describe Anthony Road, it sure sounds like a great place to have an encounter. It definitely is. And there's a lot of like switchbacks on it, like you're going around a lot of blind curves. You know, woods growing up on both sides of you when they're doing corn that year. I mean, it's 10 feet away from the car. I mean, if you, if you were to pull off the road a little bit, you could put your hand out and probably hit the corn as you went by. So it kind of funnels you in. It definitely funnels you in into a very narrow road. And there's no turning around on that road. You couldn't get away from something if you had to by turning around real quick. Straight's pretty much all you can do. <laughs> Forward. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. And when the corn's up, especially at night, I'll bet that's an extra creepy place. It is. And when you're growing up in a small town like that, there's really nothing to do. So you go out and you cruise around out in the boondocks and, you know, try and scare each other and spook each other and tell stories. So that's kind of what we did. We would go out drive around. We've got a supposed crybaby bridge here in Germantown that all the kids would go out and drive up and down. So that's kind of how we entertained ourselves. And that was a very spooky road. That kind of brings me to a story. There's a couple things that I would cover with you. My younger cousin, I think like maybe five years younger than me, her and her friends were out driving around one night. And me and my cousin, who was pretty much my best friend at the time with her brother, we were at their house, and they came back to the house, and they were all freaked out, and they're crying and everything. And like You could tell they were really scared. They were shaking, and we're like, you know, hey, what's going on? We thought somebody was messing with them. And they're like, we were just out on Anthony Road driving around, and we'd come around one of the bins, and there's somebody laying in the road long ways, and we couldn't get around them. And we're like, what? I think this really happened to them, because you could tell they had been crying, like tears streaking down their face, kind of marking their face. And they said, yeah, like we pulled around the corner. The guy's laying there in the middle of the road, so we stop. We don't know what to do, and then we're kind of sitting there for a minute, freaking out, so they put the car in reverse to try and, like, try to back up, and then when they did that, the guy apparently jumped up and ran at the car. So they really started freaking out and then threw it in drive and tried to take off, but they said that people had come out of the cornfields on them and started trying to open the doors on them to, like, get inside the car on them. It's a really weird story. But I believe that happened to those girls, or at least they believe that it happened to them because they were really, really scared. You could tell they were really shaken up. And that story right there, I wanted to tell you that because that explains what we were doing with guns out there the night that we were out there because we thought that people were out there messing around. 
you know, <laughs> dogmen and werewolves weren't on the radar that night until that happened to us. But we didn't want to go out there and then run into some people who would try and do something to us. So we made sure that we were able to protect ourselves. And I'm sorry, but I got a little sidetracked. <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. I'm glad you shared that story with us. And yeah, now that you've explained what happened to them or seemingly happened to them, I can fully understand why you went out there armed the way you did. All right, Mike, please tell us about your encounter. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. Myself, and I believe it was five other guys, at least four, we decided to go out there one night. What we were going to do is we were going to, and we would do this every now and then, we would go out someplace, we would pick a field, we'd park off the side of the road, and we'd walk into the field, and we'd sit down and, like, drink some beer. That's what we would do out there. If there wasn't nowhere to go to do it, and I'll admit that some of us wasn't 21 yet, so we would, like, sneak out and, like, go drink somewhere where we knew we wouldn't get bothered. And that's what our intentions were that night. So we went out there, and I know it's stupid, shouldn't have done it, but, like, we had, like, some beer we were going to go drink in the middle of the field, and we had guns with us. So not a great combination. But we were young. Wasn't really thinking, wasn't that smart. So we drive up Anthony Road one way, all the way, and then turn around and come back. And what we were doing was we were looking to see if any other cars were pulled off on the side of the road, if there were any cops off the side of the road. So we go up the road one way, we turn around, we come back. And as we're coming back, we look over and we see a field, and it had soybeans growing in it that year. They wasn't doing corn. And it was, and I hate to say it because I know it sounds so cliche, but the moon was either full or close to full and it was really bright and there was a pretty decent layer of fog laying on the ground it was probably i'm going to say about shin high so we look over and there's this big giant field and a lot of fog laying on the ground and the moonlight's kind of like got a cool glow going on and we're like wow that was really cool let's go hang out in the middle of that field so we pull the cars off to the side of the road as we could and we walk into the mouth of the field where like the farm equipment would pull in to do their harvesting and planting and everything. So we kind of walk into the field just a little bit. And when you walk into the mouth of the field, it kind of opens up and expands outward both ways and then kind of does the typical field shape. And it's surrounded by a pretty good thick tree line all the way around the field. So it's kind of almost like it has a border. So we probably walk maybe... 15 yards, 20 yards into the mouth of the field away from the cars. And I remember saying, you know, hey, let's just kind of stand here for a minute. Everybody be quiet and listen. Listen for cars, tires on the road of other cars coming. And I was thinking this, but I didn't say it. But let's also just kind of listen for like anything else out here, like people or quote unquote animals, anything like that. So we stood there and we listened for a minute. We couldn't really hear anything. It was really good and quiet. So I thought, okay, cool. So but then one of our buddies, he noticed over on the right hand, yeah, the right hand side near the wood line of the field, probably about 150 yards out, there was something kind of sitting there. And he's like, what's that? So we all just start looking at it and everything. And we're being kind of quiet and we're looking at this thing, trying to figure out if it's like a dog or what it is. It was really big. I mean, it obviously wasn't a dog. And we're thinking, okay, that's either got to be a bush a really big tree stump or a rock or something like that. So we quit paying attention to it that a minute or two and start walking the rest of the way into the field. Well, then I remember somebody looking over and saying, hey, that thing's not there anymore. So we look and it's not. Well, then one of us seen it in the field that was running directly from right to left in the field. I'm like in the middle of the field, about 150 yards out. Like it didn't try and use the tree line for cover and concealment or anything like that it's almost like it ran straight out into the middle of the field got to the middle of the field and then turned straight toward us and then started coming toward us now when it turned we thought it had stopped because you couldn't really tell that it had turned and started coming toward us but as it ran from right to left it had a a movement kind of like i would say like how a cheetah or a greyhound dog runs like how they reach out real far with their forelimbs and they grab the ground and kind of jerk themselves forward. It was kind of running like that. And I would say that it was visible by about a good three feet above the fog line, at least three feet. I'm, I'm trying not to over embellish. I'm not, I'm not, I'm trying to make sure that I don't make it sound bigger than it was. Like some people say, oh, I've seen a 10 foot tall Sasquatch. Well, it might really only have been seven, but you were scared and freaked out. 
everything seems worse than what it is when fear takes a hold of you. So I'm, I'm trying to give a really accurate representation. So I would say at least three feet above the fog line, running really fast, faster than any dog can run. That's kind of what made me think cheetah. But I'm like, obviously, it's not a cheetah. It's way too bulky for that. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm kind of going through my mental Rolodex here. And I'm like, okay, that's not a bear. Bears don't move nowhere near that quick. And I'm thinking, is it a black panther? Because you would hear stories about black panther sightings occasionally just throughout the country, not really Germantown per se, but just, you know, here and there, black panthers running loose in areas where they shouldn't be. And I'm thinking, okay, is this somebody's pet? Is this a black panther? What is this? And I'm thinking, it's not a dog. It's not a boar, like a wild boar or a wild pig. It's not a bear. Bears are way too slow and cumbersome. This thing was moving quick. And I just kept thinking cheetah, but really big cheetah. And it did have this stereotypical shape that I hear so many people talk about on your show about the big upper body, like a, like a mane on the back of its neck. Or, and I couldn't tell if it was like mane, if it was hair, or if it was just the build of it, like musculature. But it did have that like top heavy bulldog kind of build to it, like, like smaller at the waist and the rear haunches wasn't as big long wise, length wise. The rear haunches was not as big as the front limbs. And it was kind of almost like, like a giant gorilla, <laughs> but obviously it wasn't a gorilla. It did have a little bit more of like a canine or like a big cat stride to it. But it was kind of like imagine, I guess like imagine a gorilla. It kind of, I don't know, like I want to say hyena at the same time, but that, that overall shape, that bigger in the upper body shape, something like that, but running kind of like a cheetah would run. And then it gets to the middle of the field and it turns on a dime. I don't know if it stopped and then turned toward us and came running toward us, but we thought it had stopped right in the middle of the field. And, and we're talking amongst ourselves. We're like, dude, what is that? Dude, that's not a bear. That's, that's a dog. No, that's not a dog. And it was bigger than any dog. Growing up as a kid, my mom and stepdad, we had Rottweilers. I've got family members that have had Great Danes, Great Pyrenees, all the big dog breeds. This was not a dog. And then plus, it was also way faster than any dog could run. I mean, maybe a Greyhound could run this fast. Yeah, maybe not. But so much bigger than a Greyhound. So common sense-wise, it didn't add up. That thing's moving way too quick to be that big. So it gets to the middle of the field. And it turns and it's coming toward us. And at first we couldn't tell it was coming toward us. And I think one of the reasons why, looking back on it, because I've really kind of been analyzing this in my brain and trying to remember best I can since, you know, listening to your show and just kind of breaking it down in my mind. It didn't get narrower when it turned to come toward us like a dog would or a wolf or anything like that, or even a boar or a pig. The size of it when it was running across from right to left in front of us versus when it turned and came toward us. It didn't get slimmer like you would expect a dog to, like how a dog doesn't have shoulders, per se, like a human does or like an ape does. So that might have been part of the reason why we couldn't tell that it was coming toward us. But then after a moment, we noticed, you know, hey, that thing is still running, and it is getting closer. And myself and two other guys were armed. I had a 12-gauge shotgun. The other two guys had pistols. And the rest of the group that was with us didn't have anything. And as this thing's running toward us, I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it is because I don't want to shoot somebody's pet. I'm thinking this might be, I, I didn't know what, honestly, I didn't know what it was. I felt like it's not a dog. I don't know what it is. I don't want to shoot it because I don't know what it is. I don't want to kill somebody's pet if it is a pet. But as it's getting closer, I'm like, um, okay. So I started, so we, we all started to step backwards slowly. As we're talking about, like, hey, what is that? And somebody would say, dude, that's a this. And then somebody goes, no, that's not what that is. So finally, and I don't know, and I, I tunnel visioned in on it. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like, I'm, I'm tunnel visioning in on the thing that's coming at me. I hear my buddies talking around me. I'm, I'm cohesive to the conversation. I'm aware. But visually, I'm looking at this thing and nothing else. So I know these guys are in proximity to me because I hear them. You can kind of sense when somebody's close to you just by, you can sense almost like, I don't know, they're just next to you. You can tell when somebody's next to you, even though you're not seeing them. So we're talking, but we're backing up. And I don't know if anybody else pointed a gun at it before I did. But after a second or two of that charge, I raised my gun up at it. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm at least going to get it in my sights, but I'm still not going to shoot yet. So as soon as I raise my gun up at it, it starts to zig 
zigzag back and forth. And at first it didn't pop in my head like this thing's being elusive because it knows I'm pointing a gun at it. Like I started thinking to myself, man, that thing's moving like a rabbit. At first I was kind of taken aback by how fast it could zigzag back and forth. And, and in my mind I'm thinking, how can it do that when it's so big and massive, the weight of it, but yet it could still do that zigzag like that. So then I'm trying to like keep a beat on it. And, and then the next thing that pops into my mind, and I'm thinking, man, I, I can't hardly keep a beat on it. But then the next thing that pops in my mind is, dude, that thing knows you're pointing a gun at it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be zigzagging and taking evasive action like it's taking. And I remember thinking that, and then that's when I got really creeped out. Because before, I'm like, you know, hey, there's an unknown monster coming at us. We've got guns. If it charges us. We're going to shoot it. But at that point, I think, is when I got creeped out. And I'm like, that's not a normal animal. And I think I remember saying, it knows we're pointing guns at it. And that's the point when everybody's really started backpedaling. And I think somebody's like, you know, hey, let's get the blank out of here. So we turned and started running toward the cars. And the cars were probably about maybe, I want to say... 30 yards away, and I'm going to be honest with you, Vic, I'm kind of taking a guess at that, but I'm going to say 30 yards away. This thing was probably about 100 yards away from us at this point, and we turn around and we start running back to the cars, and we're all kind of like, dude, get out of here, get out of here, go, 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 and then I hear my buddy. He fell down, and he was like, I'm stuck. No, he said, I'm stuck, or I fell, or something like that, and I'm like, well, you better get up and run, and at this point, I'm still running. And I'm expecting him to be up right on my heels. And he's like, dude, I'm stuck. I can't. He says, my foot's stuck. <laughs> in fact, I remember the scene in American Werewolf in London popping in my head where he runs from his buddy when the werewolf attacks him out in the moors. And he stops and he thinks for a second, like, man, crap. And then he turns around and he runs back to try and help his buddy. Like, that actually did pop in my hand. My hand, baby Jesus, Vic. I'm not kidding. That popped into my head. So I turn around and I run back. My buddy was a big guy. He was a 300-pound guy. And I remember reaching down, and I grabbed him up under the arm, and I jerked him to his feet when it happened. And I didn't know it. I didn't know, you know, hey, you know, did you go weak-kneed and you fell down out of fear? Like, what is going on? But his foot had gotten stuck in like a gopher hole, a groundhog hole. And I didn't know it at the time. So I grabbed him, and I jerked him to his feet. And then we got to the cars. And I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't remember seeing the thing that was coming at us when I ran back to get him. At this point, I kind of feel like I'm tunnel visioned in on him. Like, I got to get my buddy. I got to get him up, get him on his feet. We got to get out of here. So I helped him get up. We run and we jump in the cars. And then we had two cars. And Anthony Road, it's gravel. So you can't really accelerate quickly. You're going to lose traction. And the last thing you want to do is try and take off too quick because you might run off the road because the road's so daggone narrow. So we jump in the cars and we're taking off. And the field itself, there was a fence, like a wire fence, like where you've got like, posts every so often and then you got like the thick square grid wire fencing that kind of blocks it off that separated the road from the field and i feel like i was in the back seat of one of the cars i think i was in the back seat and i was on the right hand side the passenger side and that's the side the field was on and as we're taking off we're kind of pulling away at a little bit of a 45 degree departure angle i would say because the fence where the field is, like that part of the tree line and the fence kind of gets a little more grown up, like with shrubbery and bushes and stuff. And that area starts to widen as far as like the thickets as you go down the road, like kind of like if you got the field off on one side in a square and then you drew a line kind of off at a 45 degree angle going away from it, that's kind of how the road was set up versus the field. And I remember looking out the passenger window and I remember seeing this thing, it had actually turned and started chasing the car at this point. And I think that's when I got the best look at it as far as how it moved. And I remember looking at it, and I don't remember seeing a tail. I don't remember seeing ears. And I don't remember seeing the glowing eyes that everybody talks about, like the self-illuminated eyes. I still didn't see any of that. What stuck out in my mind the most was the overall build and size of what it was and i hate sounding cliche but it has like the build and the look and overall shape and symmetry of the thing in american werewolf in london again longer forelimbs than it had hind haunches 
really narrow waisted, but big barrel chested, like big shoulders, like a silver back ape would have. And then the big hump on the back of its neck. I don't remember seeing a muzzle and that might have been due to the angle that it was coming toward the car. Like if it was at a 45 to me, and maybe I wouldn't see as much of the angle of the muzzle protruding as I would if it was completely parallel to me. That could have been why I didn't see a tail, for example. I'm not real sure. So I can't say that it had a tail, big ears, or the glowing eyes, or the muzzle. But the overall shape was definitely what everybody reports as dog man. And the thing that makes me think that that's what it was, was the zigzagging when it came toward us. And I don't think it was trying to actually hurt us that night. I don't think it was trying to get to us. Because the time it took for us to get to the cars after we started backing away from it and turning it under the vehicles, as fast as that thing was moving across the field from right to left, based off of that, if it wanted to, it totally could have had us. And that seems to be a recurring theme is like apparently these things like to scare people out of their territory, I guess. Or maybe just, I think it's definitely a higher intelligent creature. Maybe it just enjoys scaring humans and making us feel inferior to it. I really don't know. But I would say it's definitely an intelligent creature that knew what a firearm was. And that's what makes me think I've seen a dog man that night. That and the size combined with how quick it moved. It sounds to me like you were thinking that a werewolf was coming after you that night. Is that an accurate statement? That honestly didn't pop into my head until after we were driving away. We don't have wild boar around here, but I've seen pictures of them where they get really, really huge. I mean, the entire time I'm going through the Rolodex in my mind, what is it, what is it, what is it, it's this, nope, it's not that. Kind of almost like I'm like, like I'm going through, like doing like a, like a quick reference check. That was pretty much what my mind was doing other than when I decided, okay, prepare to shoot it. And then I kind of focused in on the tactics of doing what I had to do to basically drop it, to stop its charge. And then when the zigzag started, I don't think it popped into my mind, hey, that could be a werewolf per se, but it popped into my mind that that thing is not a normal animal. That's not just an animal. And I think at that point, so much stuff was happening, you know, it's like me and other guys were kind of hollering and shouting and turning to run. I wasn't thinking werewolf. But then once I was in the car and we were going down the road, the adrenaline dump, I guess, was kind of starting to simmer down a little bit. And then when I looked out the window at it, still wasn't thinking werewolf. I was thinking built like an ape, built like a hyena. But man, that thing's fast. It really wasn't until... You know, I got to say, I didn't really think about it being like a dog man until somebody told me, well, you seen a dog man that night. That's what that was. I had wondered quite often what it was. And I'd wondered if it's this black dog thing that people talk about in Germantown. But uh, werewolf wasn't on the radar, really, at the time. How long ago did you say this happened to you? I am pretty sure I was 20 when that happened to me. Because I wasn't able to buy a pistol yet. That's why I had a shotgun. So definitely 19 to 20, no younger than 19, but I think I was 20. I see. Well, it was a while ago then. It was. And I think because dog man, werewolf wasn't really what I was thinking when I seen this thing initially and for quite some time after that. Because, I mean, it had been a long time since I'd even really thought about it until I was just kind of listening to whatever show it was where I think I was listening to Bigfoot stuff. Yeah, I was listening to the Bigfoot stuff. I mean, Dogman still wasn't even on my radar. And then whenever I heard the term Dogman and I Googled it, that's when I started thinking, dude, that's what you've seen that night. So I think that's kind of what keeps me from having like PTSD that a lot of people experience. Like I've had time to kind of absorb it and process it before I really was faced with the fact that, you know, hey, dude, you might have seen like a real life living, breathing monster. And plus also it was so long ago. And I've not had any kind of crazy encounters or anything happen to me since then. So I think time has kind of lessened the impact for me. Plus, also, my encounter was not like some people's where this thing stands up on hind legs and it's face to face with them. They can see the teeth and the eyes. and Like the way it taunts some people, like looking at them like, yeah, I could get you if I wanted you. That I can't imagine. (laughs) 
Yeah, that's not a good situation. You really feel for those people. You said because of local stories, you found out that it was called a dog man, but how long was it before you found out what it really was that came after you that night? Well, nobody had really used the term dog man here locally. There was a lady that I had spoken with after hearing her on one of the cryptid shows. She said, you know, hey, if you ever had an, an encounter, give me a call and tell me about it. So I had called her to tell her about a Bigfoot encounter I had had when I was 15 years old. The Bigfoot encounter and the Dogman encounter was the two things that have happened to me in my life, cryptid related. So I told her about that encounter. And then it was shortly after that, after, well, right after I got the telling her, you know, about it, she was like, well, if it has anything else ever happened to you out there? Because she was like, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens in Germantown. I'm like, oh, yeah, I hear stories from people and stuff all the time. And she was like, has anything else ever happened to you? And at first I said no, because in my mind I'm thinking, you know, Bigfoot related, like bipedal. And I was like, no. And I was like, well, no, yeah, there was one time where we got chased by a big dog thing. And she kind of perked up. She was like, oh, tell me about that. So I told her about it. And she was listening. She was like, dude, you've seen a dog man. And I was like, what? She's like, a dog man. And I'm like, never heard of it. <laughs> And then she told me what it was. She's like, oh, yeah. She's like, they're very common out around Germantown. She's like, there's people that have reported these things but before your sightings. She was like, this is what they say they've seen. So then that's when I started researching Dogman. And then that's when it really got on my radar. And then I started thinking about, like, what it was I seen that night. And I think I got to tell you, it was a Dogman. <laughs> it was a huge ridiculously fast moving creature that I think had higher intelligence that knew we were pointing guns at it. That don't sound like anything in the animal kingdom that I've ever heard of. I don't think that there's something out there that's not yet been categorized, recorded so that we know about that. There is something out there that I would say at least as big as a silverback gorilla, just built kind of a little bit different, kind of almost like a canine that runs as fast as a cheetah. I would say that's an accurate, if it's not as fast as a cheetah, it's it's close and probably the size of a Shetland pony. So there's something out there that definitely has those attributes that does exist. And Dogman is the best description of that thing that I've heard so far. What you just described is one scary combination. Yeah. I mean... Dude, the fog was like knee, not, no, not knee high, like shin high. And you could see this thing plainly. I mean, it was, it was a bright night. I mean, you could see it well, the outline of it anyway, when it was, when it was running across from us. Um, you could see the outline of it, how it was moving. You couldn't really see features, obviously, because it was too far away. But the speed was, it was tremendous. I mean, it, it really was. I mean, moving as fast as a cheetah with the same, type of gait is a cheetah but big like wild boar slash gorilla big and broad when it turned and came toward us we didn't know it was running toward us because it didn't narrow up across the chest and stuff like it like a dog would or you know any big cat would a wolf whatever it didn't get narrow and then when we realized it was still coming at us it's like um yeah that's not good and when the zigzagging is the point that i got creeped out I felt like, I don't know if, I didn't really think in my head like, oh, this is supernatural. It just registered to me that this is of higher intelligence than any regular animal. Nothing out there knows what a gun looks like or any object. Like, it's not going to look at a car and be like, oh, that's a car. I know what a car is. I know that people drive those. I mean, it's, I don't know. I, I can tell you that's the part that creeped me out. And then we, we didn't go out there for a few weeks after that. And then when we did, it was like daytime, middle of the daytime, middle of summer, big, bright, beautiful, blue, sunny skies. And we would cruise up and down the road a couple of times. We did that a few times just here and there. But then shortly after that, you know, like we're all getting a little older. I moved to the next neighboring town over, quit hanging out with some of those guys. One of them passed away. So like some things happened and we wasn't hanging out the way we used to. So we really wasn't ever going out there to check anything out after that. So all through my late 20s, my 30s, early 40s, I hadn't even been out on that road. But then when Dogman really got on my radar by listening to your show, I tune in every Friday. That's my thing. When I get home on Friday, I'm waiting on Dogman Radio to come on. But since then, I've like thought about Dogman. 
and I think, okay, yep, that's what I've seen. So I went out there one day when it was nice and bright out, and I was actually on my motorcycle. I went out there on my bike. I got a pretty nice Harley, and I went out there. It was a nice day, and I was just out cruising around all day, all the back roads. And it was the last thing on my mind. I was just enjoying the day, just kind of enjoying life and being grateful for Earth and the fact that I get to be here and all that good stuff, you know, just having a great day. So then I end up out by the high school, the Germantown High School, and the road that runs next to the high school is the road that goes to Anthony Road. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go out by Anthony Road and check that out. So I turned and went down through there, and, and I, I'll admit, I started getting a little bit nervous because I'm thinking about Dog Man, and, you know, hey, you've seen this thing and stuff. So I was getting a little anxious because I knew I was getting ready to go out that way. But then I thought, you know what, dude, that was 20-some years ago. That thing's either dead or done moved on. And so, like, I got out there, and I went over the bridge, and then I go over the bridge, and then and it had rained a few days before that. And that road, it's not paved. It's In some areas, it's kind of just dirt. And, you know, I mean... There's like big potholes and stuff and ruts in it. So I, as soon as I go over the bridge, next thing I know, I'm on the road. I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, I forgot that the ground was really soft and there were places where there were still mud puddles because of the ruts. So I'm immediately like worried about like, dude, you're going to get your bike all dirty. You're going to have to take it home and wash it. So I'm thinking to myself, you need to turn around and get out of here. And then immediately like a wave that comes over me, dude, you're stupid. You're out here on Anthony Road where you know something at least used to be, and you're on a motorcycle. So I immediately felt dumb and vulnerable and creeped out all at the same time. And that beautiful, I'll describe the feeling as being like this, that beautiful, bright, sunny, blue sky day that I was just enjoying immediately turned dark and gray and ominous and oppressive. And I felt like something was watching me and and I don't know if that's just because I started thinking about the fact that you know hey you're basically out here on foot because a bike ain't going to protect you not that a car would to hear the stories but you know the bike just makes you feel more vulnerable and I don't know if it's just because that thought popped into my head or if maybe there was that oppressive presence that Dogman apparently seems to possess that dark ominous vibe that evilness that you don't get from other animals like Bigfoot I kind of felt that, and I don't know if like one was in proximity to me and it was watching me, but that's the feeling that I got. And, and I remember thinking to myself, you got to turn around, you got to get off this road. It was all muddy and rutted up and everything, so it wasn't like I could do it under acceleration. I had to stop, kind of do like a three-point turn using my feet to balance myself. And I remember thinking, I don't want to turn around. I don't want to turn my back to the rest of this road. And then, <laughs> by the grace of the good Lord, about that time, a car comes around the corner and I'm like, oh, people, thank God. So as they went past me, I turned around real quick to get behind them because as weird as this sounds, one of my fears about being out in the woods and something quote unquote getting me is not the fact that I got God, but the fact that nobody would ever know what happened to me. Like that feeling of if you're alone and something gets you, everyone will always wonder what happened. That kind of creeps me out. So when that car went past, I, I shuffled around as quick as I could and I got off that road. But I got that feeling. That was the first time I got that feeling that people talk about when encountering a dog man, like that sense of there's something more there than just, you know, hey, this is a bear, this is a mountain lion, that ominous, oppressive sense of evil. Like, I kind of felt that a little bit, and I didn't feel that the night that we got charged by it when it came after us. I think that was the adrenaline dump, a lot of stuff going on around me, you know, me and these other guys, you know, I know some of these guys are armed. You know, like a lot of things were going through my head. I didn't really get the feeling of the creepy, ominous, evil spookiness. But I did that day when I was out there on my bike. And I don't know if maybe it was just, be, like I said, maybe it's just because I started remembering everything that happened and I felt vulnerable. But I kind of got that a little taste of that feeling that some people talk about when they talk about a dog man encounter. Well, I'm glad you listened to your instincts. Like I tell people, please do. And speaking of the conditions that day, with the fog and it being nighttime that night, it was like an American werewolf in Germantown, Ohio out there. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of was. And like I said, that one scene in that movie, it did pop in my head when I had to turn around and run back to get my buddy. And I would say when I got the second look at it, when we were in the car, I could see a lot better. And that's kind of the shape it had, that big football linebacker shoulder look to it, that silverback gorilla type arm and shoulder structure. 
and then smaller as it went down to its legs. And I still wasn't really thinking werewolf. But in retrospect, looking at it, I'm like, yeah, that's kind of the shape it had. Kind of like the underworld werewolves, like some of them too. Like how they're kind of like bodybuilder werewolves. <laughs> like it was very thickly muscled. You hear people talk about that a lot, and it was. It was, well, I, I presume it was thickly muscled. Either that or it had a lot of like bushier hair on its upper body and upper torso and shoulders and arms than it did around its legs and waist. But I don't think that's the case. I think that it was heavily muscled in the shoulders, chest, arms, upper back, and then smaller as it got to its lower body. One other thing, I'd never heard this before, but digigrade and plantigrade. I think you had mentioned that on one of your shows about how like Bigfoot walks plantigrade and Dogman is digigrade, if I'm not mixing the two up. I couldn't tell. I couldn't see that the legs were like a Bigfoot or more like the dog man with the bent back, like with the stifle joint. I couldn't really see that per se, but I don't think it would have had like human type legs because I don't think with human legs it could have ran that fast. Just off of everything I've seen on TV, like with National Geographic and just animal shows, I can't imagine human legs running on all fours that quick. I remember in high school and wrestling and stuff when I was in really great shape, they make you do the bear crawl. <laughs> you can't bear crawl more than three miles an hour. I mean, there's no way that something with human legs was moving this quick. So I, I would say that it probably was digigrade, even though I can't really visually confirm it. Well, Sasquatch move around on all fours, plantigrade, just like a bear, and they're able to move really fast. So it's hard to say. Unfortunately, though, I'm pretty sure you're never going to be able to get the image of that thing coming after you that night out of your head. No, and I think about it, I have to admit, even though I say, you know, I'm not really traumatized by it per se, I will admit, like, taking the trash out at night, because I live out in the middle of nowhere, like, my closest neighbor's about 300 yards away. I actually live by car about not even one minute from Butter Street. So when I go out at night, because we got barns out here, like, I'm surrounded by cornfields. It's either corn one year or soybean the next. So I love it when they're growing soybeans, and I love it when the corn's not up because I can see. That way there's not a whole lot of cover and concealment for it. But there's barns out here back behind our house, so it's a little creepy out here sometimes. <laughs> and I do think about that like when I'm going outside to take out the trash or like in the mornings when I'm getting up to go to work when it's winter time and it's still dark out. One of the other things when I'm riding my motorcycle at night, when I'm out on country roads, and especially when I'm coming home because I park my bike in a barn, that's out back behind the house. When I'm coming home at night and I'm putting my bike up, that's one of the times where I think about it the worst because I'm like, man, what would I do if I turn around and there's a big giant dog man standing in the middle of the <laughs> and right in the middle of the doorway and I can't get out of the bar and I'm stuck in here and the only way to the house is through dog man. <laughs> so, so I do get creeped out. Like stuff does kind of, I get a little bit like kind of creepy here and there sometimes. Well, I can't tell you how dogmen respond to the smell of human feces, but if that ever did happen, we'd find out. Case study. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I'd probably just lose all control of everything. <laughs> <laughs> what a man does in his pants is no one's business but his own. Hey, you know, when you're looking at a 7, 8 foot, 9, 10 foot tall, upright, bipedal canine that's got giant fangs and claws, it's perfectly okay to do that. Nobody can revoke your man card if that happens at that point. <laughs> oh, there's no doubt about that. And by the way, I've got to tell you, Mike, you're a good man for going back and helping your friend like you did. I'm really impressed. And he got to, you know. <laughs> I've worked in bars and nightclubs doing security and some pretty rough places where security couldn't handle situations and I've worked with guys, some of the biggest, scariest looking guys you'd ever meet in your life will be the first guys to turn and run and leave you when you're other guys that you're supposed to be, you know, having those guys back because you're outnumbered. I know that guy and I'm like, I'm not going to be that guy. I'm the kind of guy, if you're going down, I'm going to go down with you. That's just how I am. And the guy was my best friend at the time. Well, not that I would have left anybody. I'd have went back for a complete stranger, but you got to do what you got to do, man. <laughs> well, like I said, you're a good man for doing that. Maybe just a little more loyal than I was smart. That could be another way to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand, but no, I think that just speaks for your character. That's all it did, which, like I said, that's really impressive. Experiencing what you experienced with your friends that night, do you think that dog man would have attacked you if you wouldn't have ran from it? You know, I thought about that recently. 
and I don't really know. I think the worst case scenario, well, other than being attacked, would have been if at some point in its charge, it was like, hmm, these guys aren't running from me. Let me stand up on two feet. That would have really psychologically messed me up, I think. But I tell you what, I don't really know if it would have attacked. I kind of would have think that it wouldn't have had any other choice because it's like if we called its bluff, what's it going to do? You know, it can't just stop and be like, hey, I'm scary. You know, like leave. Like, and if we're still standing there, like hollering at it with guns and stuff, I kind of wonder if I don't, well, I'll be honest with you, Vic. I don't really know because I've listened to some of the people on your show. There was a few instances where people shot guns or presented guns and, and the, the dog man turned around and kind of like just walked up, not, not in fear. It's kind of almost like it knew the gun wouldn't hurt it, but it just turned around and walked away like, hey, you're not worth my time. So I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. I'm glad I didn't find out. <laughs> I am too. Yeah, that is one of the many creepy things about them. The way they seem to instantly realize that you're pointing a gun at them and what a gun can do. That is just so creepy. As if they weren't creepy enough. Right, yeah. As if visually, even if it was just an animal, like a lion or a tiger or a bear. Visually, um, and again, like, you know, I, I've not received the full brunt of what a lot of people experience because I wasn't face to face. I didn't get to see the details in the face and stuff and the claws and the fangs. But I could only imagine that if the renderings that we see of like when people describe them and an artist draws it, for example, if that's really what those things look like and that when they're standing on two legs, I can't imagine anything scarier visually. I remember somebody on a show, they made a comment. I think it was somebody made a comment on one of your episodes where they theorized that it was psyops being perpetrated by the government. Like they created the scariest possible thing that they could. And I think that's it. We as humans on a caveman level, that's what we fear. Fangs and claws because we're used to having to try and fend those things off with spears and getting eaten by those things. So I think primarily. That's what we're scared of. And then you throw in the fear of the unknown. Like, oh, that's not a bear. Like, you know, like a bear, you'd be terrified because a freaking bear is getting ready to eat you. And it's got claws and fangs. But the unknown, I think humans inherently also have a big fear of the unknown. And I think those two things, like the visual cues and I guess the physical tools that this thing possesses, along with the unknown, is probably why so many people get so scared. I imagine that being like if a lion or a tiger was charging at you, but yet had you never seen a lion or a tiger before, you're like, oh my god, this is a real life monster. That is a good point. I was going to ask you why so many people have so much stronger of a fear response to a dogman encounter compared to a Sasquatch encounter, but I think you just answered that question for me. Maybe it is just the unknown versus the physical prowess and intimidation of it visually. Maybe it is a combination of that and the fact that it's something that's unknown and people are like, oh my God, that is a werewolf. Because movies recently, and I kind of wonder why, and I know special effects have come a long way, but we went from the Lon Chaney type werewolf to the underworld slash Van Helsing type werewolf and the American werewolf in London type werewolf. It's like, okay, who thought that stuff up? And what gave them the idea of that? Because that's too close visually to what dogmen look like. So is that part of it? Like, because we portray these things as monsters and monsters don't exist. When you see one, you're like, holy crap, that is a monster. It's a freaking werewolf and they do exist. So I don't know if it's a combination of those three types of fear just completely overloading you or if there's something else. Because I feel like there is something else. When you hear people talk, it's not just fear. It's not just that adrenaline dump fear that they get. It seems like there is an extra layer of oppressive evil. Like people think things that they would never think when they see, like even if you've seen a lion for the first time ever, and even if in movies they said, you know, this is just a monster, it don't really exist, but boy, if it did, you'd be in trouble. Even if you've seen one for the first time and you fought all those things, I don't really know if you would have that sense of evil that dog man supposedly possesses when people encounter it. And that seems to be really common. So I, I think there's something to it, for sure. And some people say, oh, it's a demon. Some people say, no, it's an animal. Some people say it's a genetic creation by the government. Some people say it's even an alien. Man, I really don't know. But if it has that sense of evil to it that people experience, I, 
I don't know. I can't really imagine it being just a flesh and blood creature. But you hear so many people saying, you know, hey, we've seen it, you know, it was chasing deer, it was eating a deer, or it was doing this, like things animals would do. So I don't know. I, I don't know where that extra layer of fear comes from. But I'm glad I never really got the full brunt of it that night. <laughs> Oh, I am too. And like you said, it most definitely does trigger that fear. Was it making any sounds as it was running straight at you that night? There was no sound. No growling, no howling, nothing. I think that it was far enough away that we wouldn't have heard like any under-the-breath grunting from just the physical movement of it running, like when an athlete is, you know, like when you're in a full sprint, you know, like you're breathing and stuff, you're kind of huffing and puffing a little bit. I don't think it was close enough that we would have heard that, but it didn't make any purposeful, like, growls or howls or anything to add, to try and scare us off. There was none of that. At least I don't think there was. I tunnel visioned in on the thing that was coming at us, and I'm trying to process, you know, like, hey, how do I deal with this? And, and I was thinking all kinds of stuff, like, you got a shotgun, you got buckshot, your pattern spreads at a certain distance, you know, a shotgun is a close-in type weapon. It's not really a great thing to use at a distance. So I'm thinking, man, I have to let this thing get within a certain distance of me before I can really use a shotgun on it because all the buckshot isn't going to hit the target if it's too far away because it spreads. So I'm thinking a lot of stuff. Like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be tactically minded, but at the same time, I'm trying to resist the adrenaline dump and, and the fear dump that's hitting me. I'm trying to maintain some cohesion in my brain. So I'm thinking all of this stuff. And I'm trying to listen to my buddies. I'm trying to listen to what these guys are saying. Like, are they turning? Are they running? Are they leaving me behind? And I'm the only one standing here looking at this thing. Are we standing firm as a unit? Are we making a retreat? What are we doing? Plus, they're also saying, dude, it's this, it's that. And somebody's saying, no, that's not what it is. And I'm listening to their suggestions thinking, okay, maybe somebody's going to say something. And I go, boom, there it is. That's what that is. So maybe I experienced auditory exclusion from the animal and I was focusing on my buddies. But I really don't think that it made any noise. Well, it might have been auditory exclusion. And if that's what it was, you were just doing yourself a favor. Because can you imagine how much harder it would have been on you if you would have heard this thing growl at you that night? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've looked up on YouTube, like, all the different animal sounds in North America. And I've Googled animals that growl. And there's not really anything in North America that has that deep, dark, guttural growl that just makes you... Like, oh crap, like a lion or a tiger. The big cats, the growls that the big cats have. Like, you hear bears growl. Bears don't really growl. They kind of moan, howl, growl, kind of almost like they're whining and complaining. The North American big cats, not really the big cats, but like your bobcats, your mountain lions. You know, they've got more of the, I mean, it's not that deep growl. That like, coming from down in the bellows that a lion has or a tiger has. If I had heard that, that might. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't hear anything like that because I would have known, okay, nothing in North America makes that noise. <laughs> that would have definitely added to the fear factor for sure. Oh, I'll bet it would have. Yeah, thank goodness you didn't hear anything like that. How long did it take you to muster the courage to go back into the woods after you had that experience? I don't know about the other guys. We kind of drifted apart over probably, I'd say, within that year. I didn't really go into the woods much at all after that. I would say not really necessarily because I was near woods and I made a conscientious effort not to. We had kind of grown up and went our separate ways and quit doing stupid crap like going out to the middle of the woods with beer and guns. In retrospect, that was a pretty dumb thing to do for lack of more colorful language. But we were young and stupid. So when we started to grow up, we wasn't really hanging out. So we wasn't really going out on the back roads anymore like we used to. Every once in a while, when you would like start hanging out with somebody new, you're like, oh yeah, well, you can tell them the story if they were into that kind of stuff. You might drive around out through there and be like, yeah, this is where this happened. And yeah, I heard that something happened to this guy over here. But I never really went out into the woods, but it wasn't because I was near the woods and said, oh no, I'm not going to go into the woods. I just kind of wasn't really in a situation where being out in the woods was really a common thing moving forward from that point because I moved to the next town over which isn't as small townish as Germantown is. It's like a decent sized town, a lot more businesses and everything, but it's more town area. There's not a lot of country area out there. And I lived in town, so I really wasn't out in the woods much until I moved back out here to Germantown where I'm at now. And not that there's a lot of woods per se, but you know, I'm kind of out in the middle of nowhere by myself. 
and we would have like bonfires and campfires. So I don't really get an opportunity to go into the woods. At this point now, I'd be fine with it. I'd go into woods as long as I didn't get that feeling. I, I know to pay attention to that now after having the experience on my bike when I went back out there and I just got that weird feeling. I know what that feels like now. And other things that just kind of being around the woods when you're younger that you grow up knowing like, you know, hey, when the woods go quiet, there's a predator in the area and you start paying attention. If I had been in a situation and we're going into the woods shortly after that happened, then I would be apprehensive. I definitely wouldn't have went at night. I would have only went with a group of people. I would have preferred to be armed. Nowadays, you won't catch me in the woods at night by myself. There's no way. If you do, I would have other people with me, and I would definitely be armed, suitably armed. Daytime, I'm okay with it to a point. I know that that doesn't really mean anything. You can still have an encounter in the daytime, according to a lot of stories that I've heard. I mean, just as common as you do nighttime encounters. But I think in daytime, you know, obviously we're not as much of a disadvantage. We can see better. Things really can't sneak up on you as easily. And I think there is a human primordial caveman type fear of the dark because that's when predators used to come out when we were cavemen and before we had firearms, and before we congregated in areas that became towns and cities and, and we grew in numbers and clusters to where these animals wouldn't come after us. But during pioneer days, well, before pioneer days, like in caveman times, and even the pioneer days, when you didn't have neighbors living right next to you, you didn't have street lights. We had an inherent fear of the dark because that's when these things came out. And without firearms, we're not the apex predator. We're pretty soft, easy targets for an animal to kill. And so I think we do have an inherent fear of the dark. So daytime, it's a little easier for me. Still don't go into the woods unarmed, though, kind of as a rule, really whether daytime, nighttime, by myself or with others, just because you never know. There's a lot of coyotes out where I live. You hear them running through all the time. So I know not to be out in the woods without some means of protecting yourself, like even without it being dog man. You never know when you might run into some nefarious people doing weird stuff in the woods and you need to be able to keep them from trying to do something to you or a pack of wild dogs. I almost got attacked by wild dogs once when I was a kid out running around in the woods. I was 12 and we lived in a different part of Germantown, but there was a lot of woods behind the house. And I would go out in the woods and I would ride my three-wheeler for miles and miles and miles. Like I would go from Germantown out to the woods. I'd end up in places like Farmersville and I don't want to say New Lebanon, but there were some places where I'd kind of end up where I was miles away from home on my three-wheeler. And I'd get off and, you know, I'd go climb a tree or do something. <laughs> One of the weird things I used to do is I, I'd like to go out in the woods, climb a tree and read magazines like four-wheeler magazines, dirt bike magazines, because that's what I was into back then. I'd go climb up in a tree, and I'd read a magazine. <laughs> and through just being out in the woods, out running around, there was one time where I was out. I can't remember what I was doing off my three-wheeler, but I was traipsing around in the woods, you know, without a care in the world, and a pack of dogs came up on me. And there was like maybe three or four. And none of them were like big, scary dogs. Like there wasn't no Rottweilers or pit bulls or anything or German Shepherds. They weren't very big dogs, but they still scared me. And I remember picking up a stick and kind of trying to poke at him and chew and stomp my foot and stuff. And they tried to kind of, well, they did kind of try and circle me a little bit, but I kept like turning and like, like, no, get out of here. And finally they kind of trotted off and I got back in my three wheeler and I got the heck out of there. So it was scary at the time because, you know, I thought, oh God, I'm, I'm about to be dog food. But it wasn't scary in like a sense, like, you know, like a cryptid type thing, obviously. Just, you know, that kind of made me realize, you know, hey, dummy. You don't need to be running around out here without some kind of protection. And then I started collecting knives and stuff because I wasn't old enough to have a gun. So then whenever I would go out to the woods on my three-wheeler, I would always make sure I had like a knife or a machete or something to at least protect myself from dogs. You've obviously put a lot of research into dog men, Mike, so you'd be a great person to ask this next question. What's your take on the Gable film? Do you think it's real or a hoax? Oh, you know what? That's funny that you should say that because I remember seeing it. And I was like, holy crap, that looks like the thing that came after us that night. And I, and I thought it was real. I'm like, wow, I'm like a piece of footage managed to get out that they wasn't able to scrub from the Internet. Cool. I personally think it was real. I think that everybody saying that it was a hoax is a cover-up. It's a misinformation ploy, kind of like Project Blue Book. I kind of think that's what it is. I really do, because I don't think a guy in a ghillie suit could run on all fours down a hill through the woods around trees as fast as, the, I mean, 
Not to say that that thing was moving super fast like what I've seen, but I just don't think a person could do that on that kind of terrain while wearing a freaking ghillie suit. I just really don't see it happening. And I never really thought about it being misinformation until I think somebody posted a comment on one of your shows where they said something like, Dog Man is not a hoax or something like that. And I thought, you know what? I have always thought that that thing looked too real. So I went back and I kind of watched it a few more times. And I'm like, you know what? I'm like, that could very easily be real. And all this hoax story is government cover-up or misinformation kind of being fed out there. Because misinformation, that's a great way to like make people scoff at what could really exist. Like, let's make it even more outlandish claim. And then that way people will think that it's like so ridiculous that it could never be true. So I know the government does that kind of stuff. And I really think that maybe there's a real good chance that the Gable film, oh yeah, they could very well be legit. And I would not be surprised to find out that all of the hoax information flying around out there about it turned out to be false. When you look at how nimble the subject in that film is when it moves about on all four legs, yeah, I guess I can't dismiss it out of hand as possibly being the real thing. So, yeah, maybe it is legit. I don't know. But having said that, Mike, it's about time for us to get out of here. Before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? I would say probably about the only thing I would really say is, is, and I know this wouldn't really be for the people listening, because the people listening, I would say most of them believe that dogmen do exist or that there is a strong possibility of it. But, you know, it's just, it's crappy that society would ridicule somebody because it takes a little bit, I won't say guts per se, but, you know, you got to be willing to weather the ridicule that people are going to lay upon you whenever you say, you know, hey, I've seen this. This is real. I believe this. This happened to me. People love to point fingers and scoff and laugh, especially in large groups. But nobody has anything to gain by saying they've seen a dog man or a Bigfoot or, or anything. There's nothing to gain from it other than the fact that you know that some people are going to make fun of you. It might cost you employment opportunities. You might get labeled the weirdo. Oh, that guy believes in werewolves. So when somebody says something like that, even if that ain't really how things happen, it's how it happened in their mind. They really do believe that's what happened. And I think a lot of times that is really how it went down. I think there's things out there that we have yet to discover. I think that Dog Man could have been around for thousands of years right alongside mankind. You hear the story of the sign of syphili, if I'm saying that correctly. You know, just don't scoff at people when they tell you a story about something that happened to them because they're kind of opening themselves up to you and they're allowing themselves to be vulnerable and they don't have anything to gain from it. Very well said. Mike, thanks so much for coming on and sharing that experience and your opinions with us. I really appreciate it. Oh, hey, I'm glad to finally be able to be on the show. I'm a fan. I listen to it every Saturday. <laughs> well, thanks for listening and thanks for coming on. It's been great talking with you. All right. Thank you, buddy. You too. Hey, thanks. We'll see you. All right. Bye. Bye. If you've had a dog man encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.